Thank everybody for coming this afternoon. Uh, I know a bunch of your JBS producers appreciate you all getting out. I know some of you drove a pretty long way to get down here. Um, would like to let everybody know uh, these sessions today are being uh, recorded, audio recorded, so and uh, that'll be meshed up with the slides that we use, and this is all going to be available on Swinecast, so you can review this at a later time. Um, also, you can pass the information on to your friends if you see some really good information here you think somebody else would benefit from. Um, today we are going to talk about free money. Uh, I know a bunch of you just had a free lunch, and so free money, what better, could, what better thing could we come up with to talk with? But, so I, um, a little background on me, I have been working with nutrient management in some form or fashion for about the last 40 years. Um, I grew up on a, uh, well actually longer than that if you take the time when I was growing up on a livestock and crop farm over in Henry County. Um, worked with uh, Soil and Water District for a while, worked with Missouri DNR, and now I'm working with JBS Live Pork as uh, environmental manager, so I work with farms across Missouri. If I would encapsulate my job, put, put it into a nutshell, my job is to make sure that nobody makes a mess, and if they do, I make them clean it up. Okay, one of the ways that, uh, that we make sure nobody makes a mess is we take care of managing nutrients, um, which is part of what we're doing here today. We're going to talk about ways that you all can enhance or can expand the nutrient management on your operations. Um, for, the, for our meeting today, I asked uh, Jim Plasmeyer with Missouri Department of Natural Resources to come speak with us. Jim's not with the regulatory part of DNR. He is with the Soil and Water Conservation Program. It's one of DNR's non-regulatory units. And then also I ask, um, I'm sorry, Laura, I forgot your last name when I'm standing up here. Lauren Cartwright with, Missouri, with the Missouri Office of Natural Resource Conservation Service. And I'm sure many of you at some time or another have worked with NRCS or with USDA. Appreciate both of them being here, and I'm going to ask them to briefly introduce themselves in a little bit. Okay, leave the microphone here with you. Ian. I put the contacts at the start of this presentation, so again, when you pick this up on the internet, you'll be able to pick up those contacts because I think some of you will have questions that you will come up with later on. We're only going to have 45 minutes today. We're not going to have time to get to really drill down deep on this. We're going to have a pretty high level view of it and get you all the ideas of where you can go for assistance and what kind of things are available to you. Okay, so whether your hog farm is fair to finish, whether whatever type of operation you've got, whether it's an independent operation or a contract, whether you got pasture, pastured pigs, whether you got pigs over you know, confinement, over deep pits or lagoons, you're going to have nutrients to manage. We know when we feed pigs, pigs poop. Pig poop is nutrients, and that's the thing that we have to manage. Okay, we got some challenges with nutrient management. Okay, primary challenges: the collection, transport, getting that manure applied, and then planning for that. We shouldn't go out and just willy-nilly apply manure on cropland. We need to do planning. Planning something that takes, uh, in addition to the work it takes, it also there's an expense to it. Has anybody had a nutrient management plan written recently? What scares me, I don't see any hands go up. Okay, so, uh, so Terry, you're in the back of the room. What, just initial reaction, if you don't mind sharing a little bit, what's a ballpark figure for a nutrient management plan, like a per acre figure? Or maybe a total cost on one? So what, yeah, Jared, what, what do you think? Okay, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't, I don't hear very good. Uh, seems to me, okay, when, they, when, you know, when we first started out, uh, and we had the, uh, uh, you know, the assistance, and they were pretty pricey. Uh, you know, after you had, you know, the initial uh, plan and stuff, but right, the beginning and the beginning, uh, it's really fairly meaningful. Um, I'm going to say uh, the last plan we had, but I think we're doing the process right now of having some road up, but they're not quite finished yet, I don't believe it. Uh, so we should be, should be getting the price on that, but 
I was thinking it was around two thousand dollars. I think it had like a three hundred acre planting right up. Okay. I've heard ranges from a renewal from rewriting a plan or, or updating a plan on a few acres from five hundred dollars to ten thousand dollars for a new plan when you're looking at, at acreages up five hundred to a thousand acres. So significant investment there. That's a couple of things we're going to talk about today is how you can maybe offset some of that investment. Okay, what's the thing you need most? Well, we talked a little bit about money. What's the thing you need most to offset your nutrient management challenges? I can tell you if I was in the business what it would be for me, money. Everything comes down to economics. Money makes the world go around and it takes money to make money. I don't think anybody would argue with any of that. Um, if, we have, if we have a problem, you can't throw money at it, but it does make problems easier to solve when you have financing available. Okay, the primary challenge with money, though, is where to get it. You all know it doesn't grow on trees. Yes, every time you smell pigs, it smells like money. I agree with that. But we have to be able to convert that smell. We have to be able to convert those nutrients over to money. And sometimes it takes something to get us started. So where do we get that? Okay, well, when it comes to financial assistance for nutrient management practices, Missouri's in a pretty unique situation because unlike a lot of states, we have two cost shares available in Missouri. Okay, we've got cost share through USDA, through the NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service EQIP program. And Lauren's going to talk about that today. And then Missouri, many of you have heard of the Parks and Soil Sales Tax. And that's where our, our state cost share is funded. And Jim Plassmeyer is going to talk about that. So with that, Jim, I'm going to ask, would you go ahead and just introduce yourself and just briefly your background and how you came to be here today? Thank you, Jerry. Um, like I said, my name's Jim Plasmeyer. I work for the Soil and Water Conservation Program within the Department of Natural Resources. Um, I've been working within this program for 20 years now. Kind of like Jerry said, he started out with our program. Um, I started out the same way as a district coordinator working with our soil and water districts out in every county in the state. Actually, if you've been into the USDA office, you've been into our soil and water conservation offices as well, too. We're co-located in uh, almost every county in the state. Both of our agencies are in the same building. Um, as far as within the state of Missouri, you know, Jay, Jerry's mentioned a little bit about it. You know, we do have a state cost share program um, that is funded through the state parks and soil sales tax. Um, it is a... Um, for our cost share program, it is a $40 million cost share program that we have for this, this fiscal year. And um, <clears throat> we do have some funding in there for nutrient management as well as animal waste management. And there'll be some of the things we talk about today as well, too, is what we're, our goals are. Um, a little bit else on my background. Um, I am grew up as, far, as a farmer in, in the south central part of the state. I have an animal science degree from MU. Um, and like I said, I've been working with the department for, for 20 years. Yeah, um, so I'm Lauren Cartwright. I'm with NRCS, as they said. Um, I've been in Missouri with NRCS since about 2004. I came here um, actually as a, a watershed economist. That's my background. I'm an agricultural resource economist. Um, and I just sort of morphed after a few years into programs work and have been managing the EQIP program for Missouri Oh, about five years now, I think. Time tends to fly. <laughs> so um, so that's been a lot of fun. I work really closely with a lot of my colleagues. A couple are here today on the technical side. Um, and as far as f sort of our animal waste projects, so we do every year under EQIP have financial assistance. So there's a little difference in terminology co between cost share. We call it financial assistance, and we can talk a little bit about why that is. But our financial assistance, um, we do parse out our allocation into um, what we call a fund account for animal feeding waste operations. So specifically to target producers um, for nutrient management and waste management on um, confinement facilities and related facilities. So, so it's definitely something that as an agency we look to do. Um, as far as our EQIP program, and I think, what else did I miss? Anything else? Does that work for now? Think, okay. I think that works. All we'll right. have more time to get into things. Okay. So, and, and I will let you all know up front, both of these folks sent me good presentations, 
And I took their presentations and mixed them all up and put them all together so we could have one moderated discussion here. So some of the things on here may be as big a surprise to them as they are to you all. <laughs> We're going to work through this. But uh, one thing in common, uh, hog operations, even if you've got a small footprint operation, um, you know, just a few acres with a barn on it, you still have land that has to be managed by somebody. Um, one of the things involved in that was a conservation plan. I'm going to ask both of them to talk about that in a little bit. Um, also, Lauren mentioned uh, financial assistance terms there. We're going to talk about technical assistance. I want to real quick mention, uh, Lauren mentioned that a couple of her colleagues had come in. There was a few people I kind of wanted to mention that I picked up as I saw in the audience. Ting Lim uh, with University of Missouri Extension walked into the room a little while ago, agriculture engineer. Uh, Troy Chockley with NRCS, and uh, Kurt Beckman with uh, Missouri DNR, Ag Liaison, and appreciate you guys all coming in. Um, if there's anybody in also that, uh, that does any design work or anything with CAFOs, you know, feel free to chime in here. I'd like to let everybody know, anytime you've got a question, feel free to ask them. Um, we don't have to get through everything in this presentation today. The main thing, again, is to get you all a good view of, of what's available out there and how to, how to access those resources. Okay, Kurt, could you talk about the DNR cost share program? I'm sorry. You mean Jim? Jim, Jim sure. talk about the DNR cost share program. Okay, so yeah, this is one of the slides that, that we sent up to, to Jerry. Um, so like I said, our state cost share program is actually a $40 million program. Uh, it is a 75% cost share assistance um, based off the state average cost. It's not based off of your actual cost. Um, we, we pay on what the state average cost is. We work with NRCS and our local districts to establish that state average cost. Um, we also do have incentive payments. We do pay um, to follow a nutrient management pay plan, a pest management plan, and then also we do have some incentive payments as far as cover crops as well, too. Um, the biggest thing that, about our whole program is we're, we are that conservation effort uh, focus. Like Jerry mentioned in his opening remarks, as far as the park soils and sales water, uh, parks, soils and water sales tax, tongue twister. Um, but that's one of our requirements is that was the whole reason that tax was on the erosion efforts. And in the last seven years, we expanded it more to water quality as well, too. So, you know, we focus on those efforts as far as conservation and um, water quality is what we do. Um, as far as on permanent facilities, now we do not cost share on the side of, of the operations that are permitted. In that permits, there are certain requirements that have to be met as far as in those, those permits, so that's why we don't cost share on that. But we may be able to cost share on other parts of your farm that would help meet those permits as far as field borders, filter strips, uh, things along that lines. We have some things that we may talk about a little bit later. Uh, but like I said, if it's required as part of your permit, we do not provide cost share assistance because, that, again, that's part of the, the stipulations of, of getting that permit. Um, and I done mention that last bullet point there as far as our $40 million cost share for 18. And that's $40 million per year, correct? We ask every year for our appropriation authority. We're going right now through the budget budgetary process, so it, it may change. Uh, but this year we're asking for $40 million as well for the FY19. State fiscal year starts July 1, so um, we are asking for another $40 million appropriation in fiscal year 19 as well. And is that... $40 million getting you, the, the annual appropriation you've asked, is that getting used every year? Is there some left over? Do you run short? Last year in fiscal year 17 was the first year that uh, we had a $40 million. So that was the highest that we've asked for. And last fiscal year we spent almost $38 million of that $40 million. So that, that is typically we spend around 90 to 95% of our appropriation is typically what we spend every year. Because there's a lot of factors, whether you know, economy and stuff like that at play into how we utilize our funds. Okay. Lauren, you got to take, take it from there. Can you kind of contrast for us how NRCS, how EQIP is similar or different from that? 
Yeah, so definitely some similarities, but there are a few differences. Um, so just to make sure everybody's clear, the NRCS EQIP, it's, it's a federal program, so it's coming out of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, so uh, we do get allocation every year from headquarters. We just got our allocation for fiscal year 18 right now. We did get $30 million this year for EQIP. So that's on the high end for us. I'd say since I've been working on EQIP, our allocation is typically between 25 and $30 million in Missouri for EQIP. So we're doing well with it right now. We do tend to spend all of it. It's a very competitive program, but that $30 million, of course, it covers not just animal feeding waste resource concerns. It, it also covers um, cropland, pasture, hayland, um, all kinds of wildlife, forestry. We cover a lot of different land uses. So um, every year, like I said, we do set aside a portion of our allocation specifically for animal feeding waste. Um, that's just something we always do in Missouri um, to meet those needs. And we pretty much spend all of that. It's, a, it's not, a, not our most competitive fund pool, but it definitely is quite competitive. But we do get a lot of good projects on the ground through that. Um, so the other thing, and another thing that's a little bit different, I think, is we do have a competitive ranking process. Um, so you, you can put in an application for EQIP year-round, but we will have batching periods. Our batching periods have typically been around the third Friday in November every year, but we do announce it every year officially. Um, and then we go through an eligibility and ranking process for your application, and then we start funding based on highest ranking score down. Now, our ranking process is based on resource concerns. Everything we do is based on addressing resource concerns. That's our mission. That's what Congress has told us in the Farm Bill is our mission with the money they give us. And so we're looking at water quality resource concerns. A lot of times with animal waste situations, we are water quality is a big one, nutrient management, um, those kind of resource concerns. So a lot of times our ranking for animal feeding waste applications have to do with, you know, where are you on the landscape? Are you near bodies of water that we can do some work to prevent nutrients from entering, that kind of thing. Okay. So, question. I, so, between the two, the two different programs, we've got about seventy million for Missouri. Yeah. Um, one program is most of it's getting used. The other one is more than getting used. Okay. So, if I'm Joe Hog Farmer, and I want to apply for um, financial assistance on getting some nutrient management practices done, so. Can I apply, do, do I apply for both at the same time? Do I have to choose? What, would you two talk a little bit about what happens there? Um, yeah, there's no, I mean, you can apply for both at the same time. Now, you can't double dip, what we call double dipping. <laughs> so, which, that might be a little self-explanatory, but if you get funded under one program, then, you know, you would probably need to remove or, or change your application the other if if the practices were the same. Now, there may be some complementary things you could do under state cost share and an equip contract on that same operation, but it would just be an assessment of what each contract would have in it to make sure that those are complementary activities and not, like I said, this double dipping. You can't get paid under both programs for the same thing, um, and which which will could happen because our programs do overlap sometimes. The other thing I wanted to clarify, I forgot, it just kind of contrasting and comparing the programs just to make. Um, ours is not a cost share program. We call it a financial assistance program. So you get a flat rate payment for whatever practices you're agreeing to in the contract. You'll know what that amount is when you sign the contract. And even before that, when you're deciding whether to go on with the contract with us. So you can get the amount of money that you're going to get paid under EQIP to implement these practices um, and then you can decide, you know, okay, that's going to compare with here's what the contractor bid is, how much is out of pocket. You'll know that up front. That's kind of the way it works. So it's, it's, a, it's a terminology difference, but it's a little bit different functionality as well. Jim, what can you add to that? For the, the state cost share side of it, we do not have a ranking process like EQIP does. Um, it's kind of a... First come, first serve is, is about the way most of the districts operate. Uh, you do have to request it through the local soil and water conservation district. Uh, they handle all of the contracting basically for the state of Missouri. Um, the local boards make the determination as, as, as far as who actually gets the cost share um, there within their counties. They also make the determination of what practices they want to offer in their counties. Uh, we have seven resource concerns, anywhere, like I said, from sheet and reel and gully down to the animal waste, and it depends on that local board if they ask for 
from us to receive any monies in those individual resource concerns to be able to work with local producers. So that's where they would have to, the producers would have to work with that local office to determine if they have funding available that year. Uh, we try to make it available uh, if they, there is a need that comes in that the board didn't foresee when they were asking for money from us, and we try to make sure they have some funds to work with producers. And do I have to go, I'm not sure my mic comes on. Do I have to go to separate offices to apply for, for the, is each office, each program in a different office, or can I go to the same location? Like I mentioned earlier, we are co-located in the USDA offices in all but 12 counties in the state. There are 12 offices in the state that there is not a USDA office present, but the Salt Water Districts have their own office at those locations. Otherwise, it is to the same building. It's You walk in the door, it's either left for our programs or you go to the right for FSA. It's all there in, in the same buildings. Okay, re in here, technical difficulties. Okay, and Lauren, if I could get you to, this slide interested me a lot when I got to look at this. When you okay. talk, and I, I heard something the other day about USDA is going to have a new website. <laughs> I, it, yeah, the secretary just, I, you know, the email's in my inbox, and I have not had a chance to delve into it. There is some new <laughs> USDA farmer, I think it's farmer.gov. Have you guys seen that website? Okay. I haven't had a chance to look at it, so I can't talk much about it, but there's an attempt in USDA to try to have a, a one-stop shop portal for farmers to go to figure out how USDA can help you. <laughs> so so we'll ch I got to check. I got to learn a little more about that. So um, Conservation Client Gateway, this is something NRCS started a couple of years ago when we're trying to ramp up. This is a way for you to apply remotely um, and manage your your application and contract if it becomes a contract remotely um, without always having to come into the office. So this may or may not be something you're interested in, but for those of you that um, that might be, you know, comfortable with those with using a computer in such a way um, this is something we're trying to get going it's actually a, it's a decent platform I have to say I um, I've used it myself to try to test it out I was like I was curious what it would be like to use it as a not as an employee but as a farmer <laughs> and uh, and it's it's pretty nifty so I just always want to make sure and kind of put that out for folks when I'm talking to producer groups Lauren talked about uh, about focus areas a little earlier yeah. and I, does this slide lead into that right for you sure okay yeah. you want to uh, we'll talk about that for just a minute why the emphasis on those particular areas Okay, yeah, so um, one of the th reasons I kind of put this slide together is because um, one of the things that, that Jerry asked me to do in preparing for this was to, to take a little bit broader approach of what EQIP can, can provide, um, or NRCS assistance through EQIP can provide. So obviously we've talked about the animal waste and management opportunities and the nutrient management. Um, we might be talking about waste management facilities, things like that. Um, but we also have some other sort of initiatives or focus areas under EQIP that might um, be of interest, and one of them is our on-farm energy initiative. We've had this, I think, since the 08 Farm Bill, definitely since the 14 Farm Bill, um, and has really ramped up in Missouri, um, especially with our poultry producers. Um, so, uh, and, and this is taking, a lot of times, you know, existing housing facilities and making them more energy efficient, and so we have some practices to do that. And what's involved in this also is to get an audit, an energy audit for your farm to see, to identify ways your farm can be more energy efficient. And so there's financial assistance to get the audit, and then there's financial assistance to implement those ideas in the audit. And so it's a really interesting program. Like I said, it's been ramping up here in Missouri. Um, so I wanted to put that out there for you all, because I don't think we've done a lot of work with hog we've got two that have done energy but really have focused in the poultry world so this might be something that maybe you all would be more interested in taking advantage of um, and we could branch out into that more and then um, some other conservation opportunities um, 
uh, you know, ideas, things like if, if you are interested, we, we've really been promoting like the monarch habitat recently. So if you've got some idle areas of edges on your farm, um, maybe putting that into pollinator or monarch habitat, we have some initiatives for that. Of course, field borders is always very popular even through several programs, but we offer things like that. So just some, some broader sort of ideas of thinking about that, that earlier picture you showed of the on-farm conservation plan. I'm going to move us along here a little. I want to get into a little more of the uh, actual practices and technical aspects. So we're going to kind of jump forward. Uh, Jim, real quick, if you would talk about that that part of it. This is kind of similar to, to USDA's focus areas. Right. This is, um, <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, we have our, our cost share dollars broken out into our resource concerns. We have seven resource concerns as far as how our state commission allocates out the dollars to each of the districts. And then underneath each of the resource concerns, we have roughly 51, 52 practices throughout all seven of those resource concerns that producers can, can implement on their, on their farms. One thing particularly, I talked about nutrient management here quite a little bit early on. Um, from what I understand, DNR, uh, soil and water conservation or DNR will cross share our nutrient management plans in certain situations. And Jim, I'm going to ask. First thing I want to ask is: Is a nutrient management plan required to get cross share financial assistance? And then. Uh, on, on other practices, and then would you talk a little bit about how you cross share on nutrient management plans? For a, a nutrient management plan, as far as where it's required is on our animal waste facilities. Um, when we do provide cost share assistance on those facilities, there has to be a CNMP developed for those. And again, that is goes back to providing assistance with our technical advisors within our CS to give them the background that they need for the engineering side of it. So if we're doing something with swine, poultry, beef, dairy, they have to have a CNMP for that part of it. Um, and we do provide an incentive to help cover some of the cost of that CNMP. We pay up to $2,000 on a CNMP if they implement one of those structures. As far as on a nutrient management plan, we pay an incentive, incentive for other purposes to follow a nutrient management plan. It may not, this, in this case, it's not an actual CNMP. This is just a basic nutrient management plan to apply the right fertility according to your soil test, whether it's commercial fertilizer or it's manure, um, and we pay a $20 per acre incentive. Again, it's to follow that plan, to make sure you're implementing it correctly, you're recording the, the harvest yields, and in your timing aspects, it has to set back distances, what, how that plan is all developed. <clears throat> Excuse me. But like I said, it does not have to be a CNMP on, these, on this nutrient management. And again, this kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier. If you do have a permitted facility and it's part of your requirement to have a nutrient management plan, then you're not eligible for this type of assistance through the state cost share. And I know that a bunch of you have nutrient management plans because I'm the guy who wrote the requirement for that. So this guy's telling you how you can get paid to follow along with the requirements that, that are set part of part of your production agreement. Um, Lauren, nutrient management plans, what, is there a requirement? Can you kind of follow along with what Jim was talking sure. about? Sure. Yeah, so under EQIP, um, again, same thing. If, um, if you're looking for financial assistance to implement a practice that is a um, manure system or storage facility, you will or transfer facility, you are required to have a comprehensive nutrient management plan. Um, we do actually have financial assistance for this comprehensive nutrient management plan under EQIP, so you could sign up to get your CNMP one year, get that CNMP written, and then come back and sign up to implement the practices in that CNMP. So um, we do set aside money every year specifically for CNMPs. Um, that we take out of that animal waste funding, set it aside for the plant for people who need plans, and then and then the rest of the money is for the people who are working to implement those plans and put practices in. Hey, real quick, uh, both of you use the term CNMP, and we've talked about NMPs, and I require my folks to have an NMP. Um, but could you, real quick, what's the difference between a CNMP and an NMP? Yeah, so a comprehensive nutrient management plan includes the waste waste um, creation and storage and handling. Um, and then, and then if, ap if, if the application, applic it's going to be applicable 
application of those nutrients. If that producer has land, they're going to apply it to you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Um, Lauren, I think this is one of your slides, limitations. And Jim touched on that about permitted facilities. Could you address that a little bit? Does NRCS cost share on permitted facilities? Yeah, as far as I know, we don't have any restrictions as far as that goes. Is that correct? Okay, I'm getting back up here. <laughs> so, yeah, we don't have restrictions as far as that goes. And actually, there is some language in the Farm Bill that specifically directs us to assist producers in those situations. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's not a limitation we have. But these are some limitations that the EQIP program has. Um, and maybe Jim can, can confirm whether or not this was similar for you guys. But um, the first one is we don't build animal housing, okay? So um, that's, the, that's the number one rule and something we come out across quite a bit. Um, also, for this financial assistance, you do need to qualify as an animal feeding operation. And I have the definition because there might be multiple definitions out in the world, but this is the one we use here. Um, so you need to actually be in, an AFO to qualify for this financial assistance. Um, and then you must be an existing operation. So we do not, we do not provide financial assistance for people to become new operators. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Yes, Jim. <clears throat> I just want to, uh, you know, on the state cost share side, basically the, the first one is we're in a similar case as well, too, on the animal housing part of it. We don't necessarily cost you on the animal housing. Uh, we provide our assistance for the collection of the waste, the storage of the waste is the main focus of our state cost share program. Uh, we do not require them to be an AFO. We basically say it needs to be at a location that there, there is a, um, an issue with the manure handling or, you know, where they're feeding livestock currently and stuff like that. And then we're the same way. It has to be an existing situation. We won't provide cost share assistance on any type of expansion. It's based off the current animal units that are, that are on the farm. Okay. So Jim talked there a little bit about something that got me kind of excited about this when we were talking about this project or this, this workshop coming up. And uh, one of the things that, that I know in, with existing hog operations, 99% of you already have the collection system in place. You've either got the deep pit or you've got the lagoon or if you've got a hoop building and dry bedded system, you've got collection. One of the things that I've run into with my contract feeders is that they build a system and it works, but it doesn't work as good as they would like it to. They've got a lagoon out there that 10 years ago that lagoon was great, but now it's starting to get a little full of solids. Or they've got a lot of wet solid or wet manure out there and it's too expensive to haul it. So um, one of the things that I picked up through, through, um, through a little research on this was, if I understand correctly, either of you kick, jump in here, there is cost share assistance for separation systems for making, okay, so how does that fit into, and, and I also noticed there was some discussion, and I had discussions with another producer about pumps also, or about irrigation systems. So can, I'm gonna flash through some slides while I do, could you all talk about that a little bit? Cool. Um, yeah, so we do have a practice called um, waste separation facility. So that may, that may be of benefit. Um, and then we also have a practice called um, waste transfer that, um, that may be what you're referring to as far as taking, um, taking the waste from the source and transmitting it out to where it's going to be utilized. And so that's also a very common practice that we do. Yeah, and that's, an, that's a picture we did to try to demonstrate a, an, an actual installation here in Missouri of a, of a waste transfer. Okay. As far as on the, the state cost share side, we do not cost share on the transfer part of it. Um, we do have cost share assistance for solid separators um, and also some of the storage pits, storage pits as well too. Um, but like I said, we do not do anything related to transferring of the, the manure. And I want to build on what Lauren said a little bit about the, uh, about the transfer systems. And I've had conversations with several of my contract farmers, and I, I faint at the sight of manual labor. 
So when I come out there and I see you all laying out aluminum pipe and hoisting that stuff up and having to stretch it across ditches and stuff, and I get a little bit woozy, you'll understand why. I would love to see all of the aluminum pipe gone. I would love to see everybody that has a lagoon system putting in buried pipelines. I think they're, they're more efficient. I think they're safer for the environment. That was one of the things that kicked off this session was the fact that I've talked to producers that said it's the cost that's holding me back from installing one. So I wanted to make sure we got that point across that there is, if, if you qualify, there is financial assistance for installing those, those transfer systems to get those nutrients out to the field or, or to get them out further from where you're applying now. Okay, I want to talk a little on dead animal disposal too. Okay, and what, what, are the, what are the requirements there to qualify? Um, from the state cost share side of it, it goes back to the um, um, looking at what the current facility is, what their um, percent mortality rates are, and that's how the buildings are sized based off of the current uh, operation. As far as uh, other requirements, uh, we do look at as far as the nutrient management plan, again, as, as far as how are they going to dispose of those dead animals, the compo composted material, how they're utilizing it. Um, the biggest composting facilities that we probably provide cost share assistance on is on the poultry side. Um, I don't know that we've done very many on the, on the pork side, um, but like I said, we do a lot with the poultry. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we do have an animal mortality practice, um, and it can, it can, you can do all kinds of different technologies under that, from um, just a stacking shed, incinerators, drums, forced air, all kinds of different ideas in there that fit in that standard. Um, and the basic requirement, again, you need a CNMP that identifies um, what your needs are, and then we would need to do assessment of what your current situation is. And if you are undersized or, or, not man or the mortalities are not being managed and creating some kind of resource concern, then as long as you have a CNMP that identifies your numbers and needs and helps us to size it, then you would be eligible. So if I've, just a, a for instance, if I've got an incinerator that's, say, 20 years old, uh, I'm starting to get in bad shape. Maybe it's not keeping up. Can I qualify since I've got a, a current system? Can I qualify for a new, a new type or, or a new um, a new dead animal disposal system in that situation? Yeah, that'd be a maybe. <laughs> that'd be a maybe situation. Yeah, it kind of depends on what condition. That, I mean, is that incinerator not functioning anymore, and we're creating a, a, way, a resource concern because the animals are now not being managed appropriately as far as their disposal and management, or is it just you know if it, if it's functioning even though it's old? and it's sized correctly for your current operation, then probably not in that case. Does that make sense? So, yes. Okay. Jim, what systems, I'm not sure I caught this, what systems will state cost share cover? And specifically what I'm wondering, does it have to be a composter? Can it be an incinerator? Does it have to be the bin type composter? It can be one of these drums or what, what will you cost share on? Well, we, the slides up here, you know, actually slide or pictures that we provided. So we do cost share on both the composting facility as well as incinerators. Um, everything that we have right now working with NRCS based off what the state average cost is, we really don't have a, a cost associated on the drum composters. But we have done some work as far as trying to figure out on a sizing of the drum composter, how does that correlate to a bin composter and try to work out a cost share arrangement between the two. So we've done some work. Um, I don't know that we've actually cost shared on one of the drum systems yet, but we have done some analysis trying to, to make that feasible as well too. Okay. But again, it's, it's based off of looking at a bin composter on some of the cost. Okay. Okay, and Jim, could you comment on this slide a little bit? Okay, so that goes back to what we mentioned a little bit earlier, that we do provide cost share assistance on our swine waste management program. Um, but like I said, really it goes back to the slide Lauren had earlier about the housing and stuff like that. We do provide cost share assistance, but the main thing that we're looking at, we're trying to store the animal waste so that we don't have the discharge to the surface or groundwater. So like I said, we're, we're about storing the manure, 
not providing housing for the animals. Okay. And then area I really wanted to make sure we hit, and we're running pretty close on time here, so I wanted to bring this one up. Um, I know, as I mentioned, I know a bunch of you have got nutrient management plans. I know a bunch of you have CAFO permits. And I know one of the things required in those is setbacks from water courses or from streams or ditches. Okay. Um, and I've been to fields where I've seen guys farming right up to the ditch. Uh, they just put fertilizer, commercial fertilizer on that area and keep right on farming it. But I hear from them all the time, well, the trees are too close. It saps the ground. The ditch bank's starting to erode. Those areas are a real problem. So from what I understand, there is a way to deal with those issues um, and, and make, uh, make better use of those or make better management of those. So could you two talk about the, um, the, the two different types of field border practices you have? So the, the two that we have up there, the field border is um, what we have essentially is around the edges of the field. And it has a minimum width. I can't remember right now what the width requirement is on it, but in most cases those are planted, planted to grass. Um, we also have an out-of-production incentive payment per acre. Um, on that field border. The riparian buffer is that that is a practice that's going to be implemented along a stream, a natural wet area, uh, public drinking water supply, lakes, things along that lines. And again, in this one, it, there's a requirement that there has to be trees planted um, and again, a, a set distance of what the buffer is. Um, on this one as well, too, there is an out of, out of production acre Incentive. I think that one's twelve hundred dollars on the the uh, uh, riparian forest buffer is what we pay, pay out. Yeah, there's field borders six hundred dollars, and like I said, the riparian forest buffer is uh, twelve hundred dollars an acre. And then also, like Jerry's pulled up here, we also have a filter strip, uh, which is typically more on the downside of the field. The field border can go all around the whole field. The filter strip is on the lower side of the field trying to help filter any type of runoff before it hits to uh, water supplies or anything like that. So if I go into that particular cost share practice and I get that cost share incentive, then what kind of restrictions? Do I have to sign an easement? Is that still my property? What happens with those acres? There's no easements on the state cost share program, so it is still your uh, property to handle, to utilize how you want to. There are certain limitations. Um, on the field borders, we do allow haying and grazing of that, incidental grazing if you're grazing crop residue and stuff like that. Filter strips, we do not allow the grazing on it because of the... Um, you know, again, we're trying to have that filter built in that buffer area. Uh, same way with the riparian forest buffer. Um, again, we do not allow the grazing in it. It is required that you have to plant trees in that area. Um, another benefit of this practice, if that is your main water supply, if you have cattle that you're grazing, goats, sheep, what have you, if that's your main water supply is that stream, you can also receive cost share assistance on a well and tank to replace that stream as your, your water source. Okay. Lauren, uh, does EQIP, do they cover the, those two or those practices, the riparian or the field borders? Yeah, we do. I will say we don't have that um, incentive, though, so you might want to work with them on that, and we might fit better with some of the other stuff. So that's where sometimes maybe our programs can work together because that incentive makes it nice. But we do have financial assistance to install those practices. Um, it's just more of a one-time up front, get it installed. So with that additional incentive, that makes this practice a little more, probably a little better application under their program. So, but yeah. But we do offer them and very much support them as part of, part of a, con uh, on farm, a whole farm conservation plan, absolutely. You mentioned earlier you were an economist. Have you done any studies, any work on the relative profitability of like, well, you mentioned you don't have that incentive, but... Just your snap reaction then, would that incentive replace crop income on that strip? Um, what's the incentive? 1200 on the riparian and 600 1200 an acre? Yeah, yeah you're not going to make that off corn right now, I don't think. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just. <laughs> okay. Huh? Oh, it's tenure. you got to amortize that over 10 years. Okay. 
Uh, so, Lauren, real quick, you talked about the energy thing, and you also talked about other opportunities. So I want to give the next two slides to you because we're running pretty close on time. Yeah, so this is, I think I just mentioned this earlier about the energy audit um, and then the financial assistance to actually implement the um, recommendations in the energy audit. So the practices there, the main practices we have for, this, for that is the building envelope improvement. So a lot of times that's insulation related type things, increasing the insulation value of your buildings. Um, and then the farmstead energy is usually ventilation, heating, motors, automated controllers. All, it's a, that's a whole gamut of all kinds of stuff. That's sort of a catch-all practice right now and then lighting system improvements for upgrading your lighting and making it more energy efficient like I said this has been I mean tremendously successful um, and it's been growing in Missouri so I really would really encourage you all maybe to, to look into this because um, it sounds like um, pork producers have not been those that we've really have really utilized this as much as our poultry producers. Um, and then, yeah, and then the other opportunities, of course, like I said, there's other resource, um, resource land uses that we're addressing. Um, I talked about the monarch butterfly or just general wildlife habitat management. If you, if that's something as far as your whole farm plan you want to look at, um, we definitely have lots of opportunities in there and fun and funding put aside for things like that. Um, um, prairie restorations, again, that's, you know, it depends on what your farm looks like and what your goals are, of course, whether this fits or not. Um, but these are certainly other opportunities when you're looking at whole farm planning. Um, and just want to touch here, we've also been promoting the last couple of years the idea of agroforestry in the state. Um, Missouri is really well poised to, to really um, improve production or expand um, or diversify production through some of these agroforestry techniques. So we've been putting some money into a fund account for agroforestry and trying to get a little more education and awareness out. So these are some ideas of practices uh, um, under agroforestry like silvopasture and alley cropping and, of course, windbreaks. Windbreaks also have a dual role around confinement operations for odor control so they can so they can be used on the landscape in multiple ways okay yeah. I know we are a little bit past the time and we I didn't give the audience much chance for questions so I'm gonna open it up the floor here real quick uh, has anybody got a question I mean you've got you've got technical assistance and administrative assistance both so anybody got a question here that they would like to, to get out on the floor to get an answer to has anybody had any experience with applying or with with applying and and working with any of these cost share programs that they'd they'd mention? Uh, yes, Terry. Uh, Question was, what about wind energy? Do you have any wind energy programs? Yeah, there, no. <laughs> There's an interesting stipulation in the law right now as far as the energy goes um, that we are not supposed to provide assistance for renewable energy. Is, <laughs> so uh, I, so. Is that, I, I didn't anticipate that question or yeah. I would have called over. Does um, the other arm of USDA, um, rural, rural development, development do the, does anybody know? At Terry, check with rural development. In the past, I think they had something. I'm not an expert on that, but I think rural development is yeah. the people to talk to. And the rural development REAP program has some funds that can be used for renewable energy. Renewable, yeah. Okay. Our and is restricted to do energy savings of conventional energy Troy, you used an I know we used acronyms all day, but that one's really foreign. REAP is rural... In Rural economic, R E A P. Rural economic assessment program. Something like that. Yeah, hey, ask the rural <laughs> development people; they'll know. Okay. Other questions. Okay. Good discussion. Um, if anybody would has has any more questions, you know, feel free to come up and ask our panelists. Remember, if you're a JBS person and you did not yet initial back there on the sign-in sheet, it's at the back door with Dan Weatherill. Please be sure to do that before you leave. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you at the next session.